Welcome to Mining Now. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today we have Ideon Technologies on the show. Um, I'm going to actually tease it out a little bit because what they're doing is absolutely amazing. We're going to start off with the pain points in mining and how they have solved that or have how they are helping to solve that problem. Amazing technology backed up by some amazing science. Very incredible. But first, I'd like to welcome Gaudi Molina to the show. Welcome, Gaudi. Hello, good morning. Oh, I think we said no good morning, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we're trying to do this adjustment here. I know. Um, well, maybe a lot of people are listening. I hope it's they are. It's my good morning. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, early morning now that you got, you got <laughs> extra crew. Um, Gowdy? Yes. Before we can start anything, mm-hmm. um, actually, I actually should say who, uh, it's going to be Gary Agnew. He's the CEO and co-founder on the show. Right, yeah. It's going to be lots of fun doing the interview, but before we can even begin to talk to him, we need to give a shout out to our sponsors. Absolutely. So today we have question of the week and today's question of the week is answered by Tyson Krupp. Tyson Krupp Industrial Solutions Mining Technologies Division is the market leader in heavy mining equipment for continuous operations from pit to port. This includes crushing and grinding, conveying, as well as materials handling for stockyards and ports. I am happy to welcome Stefan Ebert, head of the product line revamps of Tyson Krupp's mining business, who is here to answer how does the future of mining look like from your OEM perspective? As an OEM, we expect that the mining world is currently experiencing a strong transformation. It is very much driven by a switch to alternative energy provision by hydrogen, batteries, or direct electric supply. In addition, equipment will operate more and more autonomous, digitized, and automated. This might actually lead to more but smaller sized equipment. In this environment, we at Tyson Group are on track to address these challenges of the future of mining by transforming our product offering for these needs already. Alrighty, thank you so much, Stefan Ebert, for bringing us question of the week. And next up, we also have General uh, Kinematics. Revolutionize the way you think about screening with General Kinematics STM screen, two mass vi- uh, vi- vibratory screen using General Kinematics proven two mass technology. This innovative screen is capable of handling increased ca- uh, capacities by up to 40%. With two mass natural frequency, load surges are no longer a problem. The load responsive design increases re- retention time, working the material longer, which increases screening efficiency. All these features combine to provide the most efficient, longest lasting and lowest cost of ownership uh, ownership screen in the industry. General Kinematics STM screen, screen smarter. You can start today at generalkinematics.com. We also have Fuller Brothers. Fuller Brothers Inc. has over 59 years of tire industry experience as the world's leader in providing non-hazardous, non-toxic products that reduce tire management costs for a diverse range of customers. The uh, acknowledged formula developers of the globally re- recognized Tire Life, Fuller Brothers also produces other quality products such as uh, PSF Plus, PSF Lubizit, Tire Cream, Dripless Tire Paint, Omega Tire Repair System, as well as select tire service tools and tire painting equipment. More information can be found at fullerbros.com or by calling toll-free at 1-800-547-7785. Fuller Brothers, we have the inside covered. We also have Fenner Dunlop. Hardworking people need hardworking conveyor belts to get the job done. Fenner Dunlop not only manufactures the toughest and longest lasting conveyor belts in the world, but manufactures all of their conveyor belts products or conveyor belting products in their own North American facilities. This ensures their the integrity of Fenner Dunlop conveyor belting and allows them to monitor each step of the production process. Fenner Dunlop conveyor belts are engineered to withstand the harshest conditions and heaviest loads from the bulk coal heavy metal, and precious metal mining industries. With over 150 years under their belt, their globally recognized expert sales, services, and technical teams are available to ensure your belts last a lifetime. For more information, you can visit FennerDunlopAmericas.com or call 1-800-661-2358. And we also have Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from placer to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at savannahequipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. 
And last but not least, we've got the Bucket Shop. The Bucket Shop provides wear solutions for all mining bucket applications that extend life cycles of three to four times. We ha- uh, they help clients improve productivity and reduce operating costs by providing innovative options, including their five-piece cast lip system, cast heel shrouds, and mechanical two and five-piece buckets with optional disposable front ends. Beyond buckets, they provide truck box assemblies and liners, custom builds, undercarriage systems, uh, ground engaging tools, and abrasive blasting and painting. Begin your savings today. Visit thebucketshop.ca. All righty. There we oh, go. Okay. <laughs> that was a full lineup. <laughs> that was a, that was a full lineup today. Um, but my, my now has sort of exploded. Um, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So it's good though. It's also the leading show. So uh, it's, it's reciprocal. Gary, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Um, I, I said before we started, it's a little above my pay grade what you're doing, but it's still absolutely amazing. So thank you for coming on and walking us through. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, Jared. Look forward to uh, chatting with you about our technology. Um, there's there's a line that uh, in your in your values, uh, not a line. It's a it's a title for your number one. Actually, it says "driven by industry, informed by science," um, which is like uh, <laughs> maybe one of the best lines we've seen on the show today. <laughs> um, and and that's really how you built the company, though, isn't it? Yeah, we're a spin out from uh, Triumph, uh, which is Canada's particle physics laboratory based at UBC in, in uh, British Columbia. And so from that spin out, we, we were uh, the original innovation was from deep research um, into particle physics and then applying that research to mineral exploration. So very much uh, the academic and research orientation. And over the last 10 years, we've partnered with the mining industry on proof of concept field trials to really make sure the technology we're developing solves the problems that they're they're, uh, looking to have solved. I mean, we're gonna jump in deep into the technology, well, as deep as I'm capable of diving into it with you, but um, I, I really wanted to kick this interview off with the pain points first, because I think it's such an important setup um, for what mine is going through and, and global demand. Um, can you just walk us through that, what the mining industry and that exploration um, side of things looks like right now? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think about the the pain points um, on on three different levels. Uh, First of all, the the exploration business and part of the mining value chain has been running a minus 45% return on investment for the last decade on $200 billion worth of spend. So there's clearly a very, very significant economic problem the industry has to overcome. Uh, Secondly, um, because of the shift to renewable energy, um, you know, uh, um, batteries, electric vehicles, geothermal power, uh, solar, et cetera, need critical minerals from the earth. And so there's a 500% increase in demand for those critical minerals over the next 10 to 20 years. And then finally, the third uh, side of that triangle is the world, the consumer wants those minerals uh, detected and extracted in the lowest impact way possible. So from a sustainability perspective, there's a lot to do because this will be the, you know, the cleanest ever when the industry has produced minerals. And so when you think about those three sides of the macro trend, unfortunately, uh, at IDEO, we fit squarely in the middle um, of those three macro trends, helping clients to solve uh, all three. Is the industry, um, is there, do you think it is, do you think there's, it's moving as fast as it can? I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, like how, how long is Ideon um, from, from conception? How, how long has it been developing this technology specifically for the mining sector? Yeah, we've been around for over a decade from the original innovation through to where we are uh, today. So no question it's been a, a long uh, road to get the product to the, the state we are now where it's ready to deploy um, in industry standard boreholes. Um, but I think a lot of that was um, about the, the research and the, the funding mechanisms to help a business like ours. Uh, certainly what we're experiencing, uh, the partners we're working with, there is a massive appetite uh, for change. Mm-hmm. Because if you're a mining company and you're wrestling those three different macro trends, um, you need to accelerate and, and move quickly uh, to overcome those trends for mining to be a viable business in the long term. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're finding the industry pretty responsive, quite contrary to the reputation mining has of being a kind of a slow adopter of technology. That's, that's not what we're finding, uh, certainly in our case. Do you think, um, do you think this landscape will 
companies, obviously, there's not a lot of companies that are doing what you you are doing, but there's all these other, you know, sensors and, and all these types of things that are just throughout the mines now. Um, it, does it have another level to get to, do you think? Um, I mean, you see, you see this like, uh, can you actually explain that stat, that mine, uh, minus 45% um, on, is that an inv- on investment returns um, yeah. in, in exploration? Is that what that's specific to? That's exactly what that is. $200 billion spent in the last 10 years to return $109 billion of economic deposits or economic reserves. So when you see the industry is investing heavily to win, but doesn't have the tools and the capabilities to be able to execute on that investment. So part of our role is to help, in, help improve the return on investment of exploration. And then on that net zero, I mean, obviously, the more volume side, I think that's, you know, that's one of those things. It's, it's very obvious as you see these transitions happening. Um, but on that net zero side, there's also a re- it's a real pressure, uh, a social pressure, pressure, financial, private funding, banking, all that sort. They're putting that pressure on. Um, so that must really be a huge. And again, we're going to get into the technology here in a moment. But that must be a huge accelerator uh, for for companies to have interest in what you're doing. Absolutely. I mean, I think Mike Henry, the CEO at BHP, said it best when he said it's not really a choice of whether mining happens or not. But it is a choice of how it gets done and who does it. Right. And I, that's exactly the spot we're in right now where mining companies are making some very um, progressive steps to really lead in this new emerging market. Yeah. Um, we got it. Let, let's jump into the, the uh, technology side of it. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, what, what have you built? Where is it coming from? Let's just walk through the whole story because I don't think there's, you know, I was trying to find one part that's more exciting than the other, but it just, it's, it's the whole package is a very interesting um, from, from conception to operation. So uh, just, just walk us through it a little bit. Well, let me, let, let me start with conception and, um, you know, the, the informed by industry happened right at the beginning of this innovation. Uh, a project geophysicist called Brian Powell was working in the Athabasca Basin and um, had read about muon tomography online. And he posed a research question to the team at Triumph, which was, could this technology be applied to mineral exploration? Now, thankfully for us, uh, somebody at Triumph said, we don't know, but we'd love to find out. And that really triggered uh, some initial research. Um, proof of concept was done in 2012 uh, over at Myra, Fall, Myra Falls on Vancouver Island. And then another subsequent um, series of, of field trials with companies like Tech, Murano, Cameco, um, et cetera. And what really, Jared, we heard loud and clear from the customer was like the imaging is powerful. They really like the imaging of the technology, but the form factor of the detector just wasn't going to be workable. And so to give you a sense of what, it, what the form factor was back then, is the size of a kitchen table and the weight of a small car was the detection device. And so really, you know, we, we got some powerful feedback from the industry in terms of what they liked and, and what needed to change. So if I fast forward now, um, just in the last couple of months, um, we have completed the 50x miniaturization of our bore into a borehole detector. And really, this allows us to operate in both greenfield and brownfield applications and, and allows the customer to deploy uh, the device in a form that fits with their standard processes. Um, so, yeah, quite a, quite a shift since Brian Powell had that uh, initial curiosity. And uh, really, for the last 10 years, we've been executing uh, to get the device and the overall uh, software capability ready for market. I have a question. I, I hope it's not. I hope. You know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am curious. The you talk about these shifts and these companies looking for, you know, looking to to find these new technologies now. I mean, it's they're all, you know, they. I think the, I think a major, you knew a major shift was company uh, coming when they uh, started announcing uh, CTOs, uh, you, their chief te- technology officers. If there is. Was it difficult to get these? You you just listed some very large companies. Was it difficult? You know, you have something the size of a car, and you want them to go through the process of testing, or you know, was it that 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 uh, spin being a spinoff of Triumph that really got you in the door? Just that whole process of actually getting on the ground, which I mean, can be a very difficult thing. Just in the, that alone, can be difficult to do. Yeah, and, and look, by no means is there an easy process to go and you know work with, build confidence and trust in some of the largest mining companies in the world. Um, but what, what we've done is um, we've done that progressively. So we have done local trials that 
prove the the efficacy of the technology and then sell that concept into the to the larger mining companies so it, it's not necessarily quick jared um, but as we were able to demonstrate what the technology can do that's when we found things starting to accelerate yeah okay let's talk about what the technology actually can do i was um you know, I, i'm trying to still say it make sure i say it properly in that can you can you walk us through what this technology is Sure. Um, so let me uh, start at the beginning of the process. And the beginning of the process is supernova, uh, supernova explosions in space that create showers of cosmic rays. As those cosmic rays interact with matter on the Earth's upper atmosphere, they create something called muon flux. And muon flux is bombard, bomb, bombarding the Earth's surface at almost the speed of light and, and traveling in straight lines, these individual muons, which are charged particles, and very like an electron, but more, more massive. Um, so they're bombarding the Earth and they penetrate uh, the Earth. Now, the neat thing about muons is they pass through dense material. They lose energy and decay uh, directly correlated to the density of the material. So what we're able to then do with our detectors, and our detectors look up at the sky with a 120-degree open field of view. And then as it, uh, our detectors basically detect the direction muons are coming from and the intensity muons and really from that we use our inversion technologies to create 3d reconstruction of the of the area of interest probably the best uh, analogy i can give you uh, and, and your listeners jared is uh, the medical x-ray you know the medical x-ray was introduced over a century ago and really has been a catalyst for transformation in the medical profession and obviously, you know, uh, medical X-ray is a 2D uh, representation of the inside of the human body. And then quickly, MRI and CAT scans offered that 3D tomographic capability. Mm. Um, ours is a very similar read across in terms of the technology. A couple of key differences. Um, we use a passive energy source, which is uh, muons, whereas obviously in medical X-rays, it's an active um, energy uh, radiation. And secondly, we're interrogating, you know, hundreds of millions of cubic meters of Earth compared to the medical X-ray, which is, you know, kind of looking more at a centimeter scale. Right. I'll, I'll just ask a question that there is somebody else asking that's listening right now. Are they dangerous? <laughs> no, they're, they're absolutely not. I mean, let's start from the position is there are muons uh, hitting you uh, roughly about one per second on the top of your head all day, every day and have been for millennia. And so this is not a new energy source we're introducing. We're leveraging the universe, if you will, um, in, a, in a powerful way. So absolutely harmless to humans or human life on, on Earth. Okay, so when it is come, so when you're putting you're putting your sensor down into a borehole, Gary, is it is it taking the is it detecting along the wall of what's there, or is it like I don't, again? This is this is my very unscientific question, or is it redirect? Are the sensors redirecting and and pulling out from two hundred yards outside of the bol borehole? Yeah, re really important question. So while we deploy the detectors down a borehole, the detectors can actually have a pretty wide field of view, and um, because of that one hundred and twenty degree open angle, so that. Geometric um, question, really, how much area can you search? The deeper you go, the more volume of, of Earth we can search with the detectors. But yeah, really, we, we, we are able to provide imaging of a much, much larger expanse than the drill hole itself. I mean, in some surveys on the surface, it's kind of been a kilometer square uh, and 500 meters deep, and we're, we're interrogating that volume of Earth. So way, be, way, way beyond what... Um, what drill assay or some other geophysics can offer in terms of um, your scale. So I think I'm kind of, I think I'm actually picturing it in my mind wrong. So these, these are the muon, are they called muon rays? Is that right? Yeah. So the muon rays, are they sort of like, are they coming, are they hitting the earth going through this material? And then it, the sensors are in the bore, borehole and they are, the, the, I, I'm thinking of the, the muon rays are in the borehole, which is they're, they're going in the earth and you're detecting them the sensor is just detecting them already going through the earth, which is happening continuously. Is that right? Yeah. So, so basically our detectors uh, detect when a muon has entered one side of the detector. And bear in mind, this is uh, the speed of light and also detecting that muon as it exits the other side of the detector. And what those couple of uh, points help us do is uh, understand the trajectory that that muon has traveled through. And that is what gives us the straight line imaging 
capability to be able to know with certainty where the density anomalies are in a 3D space. And then there's another, so, okay, so you get, you start to collect that data, but now there's a whole other process. I mean, I was looking at a, uh, like I was looking at, where was that? It's, I mean, there's a satellite to the cloud component. There's, it, there's, there's the AI component. I mean, can, can you kind of help us piece it together? Because detecting them is one thing and then collecting the data, processing, imaging, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, if you think about the core technologies we're using um, or, or uh, areas that we're focused on, um, particle physics is a huge part of how our solution works. And so there's a heavy orientation there. Um, you know, very high precision electronics to be able to detect at a picosecond resolution. Um, and also uh, software and AI. And increasingly, we're using that as a way to sift through huge volumes of data to be able to, you know, um, to pull together the, the 3D reconstruction for the customer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the neat features, uh, Jared, we talked about the length of time it's taken us to develop. But actually, when we started this journey, um, most of the technologies we're using now were not mature enough uh, to be used in a production environment. If you think of cloud, IoT, AI, etc. Yeah. And so actually, as we've been developing the muon detectors, the world has been developing and maturing some key technologies that are enabling what we do for customers. Yeah, it's, it's easy to think that this stuff was just around, but it wasn't. I don't even think it was 10 <laughs> years ago. Uh, Rory and I were in a restaurant. We had our computers going through some things, and we realized we could both be on Google Docs editing at the same time. I mean, that was – and that was crazy. I mean, you used to just be able to – you have to go send a document, then you'd edit it, put notes. It was just back, and it was just – which seems so ridiculous now. You can't even imagine working on, like, stuff like that. But, yeah, so – so a lot of these, so when you develop that core technology, it's really about then leveraging all this other technology that's been developed over the last few years. It's really been accelerated at a whole other level. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. From, from the detector, we send data up, up the borehole. We have a surface box. We have satellite infrastructure, independent power, and fuel cell power, actually, to be able to run for six, nine, 12 months in greenfield exploration. So wow. all of these te technologies that we somewhat take for granted today just weren't available, or if they were available, they weren't mature enough to really embed in a solution like ours. So uh, you know, for me, it's a, there's a lot of key things coming together. The market and the macro trends, the, the need is huge. And the maturation of a lot of these core technologies together with you know, neuron tomography is, is making the solution possible today. Was the integration hard or was it that developing the actual, your core technology, was that the biggest challenge? Where was sort of the, where was the sticking point in getting this, putting this all together? Yeah, without question, the, the biggest challenge was miniaturizing the Detector 50X. Um, in fact, many, many people over the years have told us that that wasn't going to get done. And so, you know, Doug, our CTO and the R&D team really have, have applied themselves over multiple years and, and we did an interim step between our V1 detector and we shrunk it down to a, a compact detector as a de-risking um, step um, to get to this uh, borehole device, which is 89 millimeters in diameter. So it's very, not much. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, computational power um, jammed into that detector to be able to do the things that we, we need to do. Why, what, why was it so difficult though i mean going from a car i mean i know computers did it and in your case why was it why was that big challenge to get it from a car size to to the borehole size yeah we were we were challenged with a few different things because we want to operate in greenfield uh, sites we had to have an ultra low power consumption Otherwise, we were going to have to have banks of batteries and on-site uh, fuel. So that was a huge uh, challenge. Um, the second major challenge was the, the picosecond resolution. These muons are traveling through an 89 millimeter detector at the speed of light. And so to be able to detect the entry and exit of that muon was a substantial um, research and development uh, problem. And then really, you know, once you're able to get the, the data off the detectors, of course, it's raw signal data. We then have to, you know, transition or transform that data into 3D reconstructions that, um, you know, can fit into industry standard modeling tools. Yeah. And so those were kind of the key things that, that really, you know, challenged us in this 50x miniaturization process. What, what is, I mean, you must have some proprietary um, technology in that. Is, that. is that in the core sensors or where, where would that be? 
Yeah, certainly we, we, we've got a number of patents um, in our core detector technology. Uh, and increasingly, we have a lot of trade secrets in software. Um, you know, the, the, the detector naturally, because it's tangible, gets a lot of attention. Um, but in, in truth, more of the value is actually created in our software, the discovery platform um, that really enables this to all make sense to the customer. And for them to be able to you know, understand our data in the context of the other data sets that they have. And so that's an area of focus for is not just providing the customer density imaging of an area, really providing the highest possible resolution uh, of an area of interest. And that includes combining other data sets uh, to be able to do that. Is there still that physical? I mean, I, I still default to it a little bit is looking for that physical aspect of what a company does. Um, is that still a conversation you have to walk people through where they just kind of want to look at the sensor? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think once you know, as customers know, we've been able to make the leap from the, the large kitchen table detector to the borehole. I, I don't detect a particular, we want to see the detector, but th- there's a lot of excitement in terms of what they can now do with the technology right. now that it can fit in, in an industry borehole, industry standard borehole. The, I want to talk a little bit, I, I think you did some, uh, uh, first of all, I saw some, there's a blind trial and a field trial, and in these terms, again, I hear them, but you know, you just sort of assume what they are, but what was a blind trial? Um, and I've seen it, you've done it with some major companies, uh, would that be one detector? Can you, do you talk a little bit about those trials? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're a new technology. And, and of course, if you're a major mining company and you're looking to invest in uh, you know, purchasing that type of capability, you want to know that it works. And so what we often do is a blind trial. And what the blind means is the customer doesn't, the only, the only data they give us is the topography of the area. We are given no geological drill assay data on the area of interest. So we're, we're walking into the survey blind. We deploy our detectors and over a given period of time, we'll come back to the customer and say, this is what we can see from our detector in terms of um, density anomalies. Now, what mining companies have, have tended to do is put us in an area of known geology where they have a lot of drill assay data, other geophysics data. So they have a high degree of certainty of what's in the area. So this is really putting us to the test. You know, blind, can we go and image what the mining company already knows? And, and certainly that's a very good way to build confidence in, in the capabilities we have. And then you move on to uh, things like the field trial um, to actually now, now, what would that be classified as or what, what does that entail? Yeah, so you know, typically once a, a mining company has done a, a blind trial, they get convinced on, on the technology's ability. Then it becomes, well, what about that technology in nickel? What about that technology in copper? What about that technology in different geological um, scenarios? And so the, the field trial is really to build out what we call our sweet spot of the areas where we know with evidence, with data, that we can make a step change in performance with the mining company. So what do you do on this? Because like, I, 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 am I allowed to say some of these names of these some of these trials? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So you got. Uh, and I don't feel like saying it right. Nier Star. Nier Star. Nier Star. Um, and they did the you did the initial field trial with them to just you're, so that's just proving the technology, right? Is that that's what that entailed? Yep. And then Tech did the blind trial, and then Orono did the uh, field trial. I'm probably saying their name wrong as well. Um, so these these companies are they is it ha, is it all completely separate communications that you're just you're saying we'd like to do this and you find a company that will engage and then you move on to the next one and then they just do it at other levels or how does that sort of that that business development process work yeah i think historically it's been very much at trade shows you know working the booth working networks to try and you know get customers interested in the technology, but actually in the last 18 months, um, you know, we've been able to put our foot on the gas because meetings now are on Zoom, not in person. And so that's certainly one area we've been able to benefit. We've probably talked with a couple of hundred mining companies and professionals wow. in the last 18 months. So the, the input we get from that has been absolutely stellar. Um, if I talk about the, the trials, the blind trial, probably the, you know, the most recent one we've done 
is with BHP Resource and BHP in, uh, in Nickel West in, in Western Australia. And so we started there with a two month blind trial in a known area of geology. We proved we could image what was uh, already known. We actually proved on this one that there was an additional deposit, additional load on the reserve that BHP were not aware of. So there was both a, um, a uh, confidence boost and a little bit of discovery. That must be a good feeling to put slide yeah. that across the table. <laughs> very, very good indeed. And, and credit to BHP, they immediately redeployed uh, detectors to uh, a very deep um, opportunity, 850 meters deep. Uh, we're just wrapping that um, survey up at the moment and talking about the next couple of surveys. Um, BHP are, are working with the borehole detector. We're deploying there in September. And so I, I guess what you see from the BHP experience, Jared, is once the client has confidence that the technology does what we say it, it does, um, they then quickly start to look at other opportunities of where it can be applied. And so that's a pretty exciting uh, road uh, for us with something like BHP. When it really comes down to it, I just also you you're collecting the data, but you're also you're you're also just be going to be boring a lot less holes if you can gather this data. Is that is that really what it comes down to? Instead of a hundred, you only need twenty. That type of thing. A hundred percent, absolutely. You know, part of our value proposition is a ten x reduction in drilling. And so, if we are part of an exploration project in the early stages, we can substantially reduce the cost. Um, associated with the risk and the environmental impact um, that drilling has um, on the planet. And so, yeah, a 10x, in, and in some of those case studies, we've demonstrated a much, much higher reduction in drilling potential. And then you have things, you know, and I, we're, we're not a, you know, we're not a news outlet, but it's worth noting, like you uh, mentioned BHP, but now they've, uh, ba they basically ex secured, or Tesla secured them as part of their supply chain. Um, so then that, of, of course, companies like Tesla and banks and all, again, what we talked about earlier, are going to be demanding those, those highest efficiencies. That's going to be a key part of what helps them continue on as a customer. So is that, I mean, again, going back to it, it's sort of an obvious one, but that must be a major driving force for really closely looking and testing and, of course, using your technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the announcement last week from Tesla and BHP, I mean, it feels like it's the two major powerhouses of their respective industries coming together, the front end of the supply chain with the back end of the supply chain. And reinvention is the, the watchword, I think, for, for that partnership. Uh, yeah. Because ultimately, Elon Musk's uh, customers at Tesla do not want to um, think and, and, and understand that there's a dirty supply chain supplying the battery metals uh, yeah. for an electric vehicle. They want a sustainable uh, vehicle that is with minerals that are sustainably sourced. So a very, very um, exciting development and, um, you know, really one we're, we're partnering with BHP at Nickel West, and that's the site that Tesla and BHP are, are coming together really focused on. And so we're looking forward to some exciting developments over the coming months in, in terms of as that gets, um, you know, more, more rolled out. I think it's going to really, I mean, I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a lean towards being on the curious side anyway. So, you know, I, I open a I open my car door and I wonder what steel that where the steel actually came from, and I think I think like so many things that he's done, Elon has he has brought these things we always knew should be together together, because you should not be the supply chain is what. <sighs> So much of the consumer experience has been at the very end product. People want to know. I mean, nowadays, again, not everybody has a time or is in a position to do it. I mean, I'll research where the leather comes from on a, on a pair of shoes. You know, like you, if you dig in, but sometimes it's very difficult to figure out. And But once you do figure it out and you know a company is doing it well, I mean, they basically have you. For the rest of your life, because now, okay, this is something I can trust. And that, I think a brand represents that more now. So I, I feel like, I know I'm going on a bit of a spiel, but I feel like him bringing that supply chain and that, that, that consumer product and bringing that together, I think it's going to change. I, I think it's going to completely change the industry, the, the way we even think about mining. I think mining will start to slowly become a very transparent thing that actually the general consumer will start to understand. I really do think that. 
Yeah, and an interesting feature of the announcement last week is that you know, BHP and Tesla are looking to use blockchain uh, technologies to be able to help um, you know, certify the source of supply from, from key minerals for batteries. So I, th- I think the, the, the game is just about to change. Um, you know, any, any sense that the mining industry is being slow to adopt, I think here you see the number one player in the market working with the number one player in the automotive market to reinvent and and, and change and, and, and deliver a more sustainable supply chain. Yeah, I'm I'm picturing going into a Tesla one day and uh, you just, uh, when all the parts and pieces, you can just source it and see the whole tracking. It could get really amazing. And I think people would like it. I've, you know, I've had people on the show and they go that the problem, mines have not gotten off the ground simply because they didn't. They went all with, they almost went too on the social issues. Oh, it's going to create jobs and that. And, that, and all they had to do was just dig into the technology because people are, we just did a poll. Um, and I think the technology, social issues, or leadership and technology is winning by like 70%. <laughs> people want to know what is happening. They really do. And I, I always feel, Jared, that technology done well is a talk multiplier. Yeah. I mean, amplifies the um, efficiency, amplifies the impact of whatever the focus that technology is. And so I think it's it's only right that mining should be alive to and, and leveraging the opportunities that technology presents in this day and age. And people will get excited about it. That's the thing. People will get excited about it. Um, the, I, so, okay, so this V1 and this V3, um, the, the V3 borehole muon detector, Mm-hmm. That is, what's the difference? I, I, you kind of touched on it, but I wanted to circle back to it. What is the difference? Because I think that's new. That's June 2021 that you brought that into the market. So is that, can you can you walk us through that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we deployed the first deployment with Arano um, late June. We're just in last uh, preparation to deploy with Fireweeds Inc. And then we're going to BHP in Western Australia. And really, the, the technology is um, you know, combining those electronics, data communications, um, you know, scintillator fibers that allow us to detect um, the, the muon entry, uh, entry and exit uh, from the detector. And so really, the, the device is now movable by a single individual. So one person can lift and maneuver it around site, whereas obviously the weight of the previous car was clumsy, it was forklift trucks, and, and you need, we needed... Uh, mines with existing underground infrastructure to be able to place those detectors. And that really was a very limiting factor to the technology. But now with uh, being able to fit in a, in a borehole, that opens the entire market up. Uh, greenfield and in mine brownfield uh, exploration projects, as well as resource delineation uh, type activity. So we, we see a, a tremendous opportunity with the new device to, to be able to expand the adoption um, of muon tomography. Will it be um, one thing? I was wondering, you know, like these the the high the the big companies. Obviously, that's you know that's going to catch a lot of attention. But I'm also wondering about smaller operators. Um, is is there a market for them? Is it something that they they could pick up the phone and, and give you a call about as well? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We're, we're working with one of the most I think one of the most innovative uh, juniors uh, in the Canadian market, Fireweeds Inc. And the collaboration, the partnering, the trying to solve problems together. I mean, uh, there have been a, just a, a great partnership, great leadership team working with us, so- solving problems for them and helping solving problems for us. Um, so, yeah, we, we definitely see juniors uh, as part of the, 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 the picture. And um, obviously, the majors offer a, a tremendous amount of adoption uh, capability. Yeah. It's, it, 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 you know, it, it's both. We, we see opportunities to work with innovative juniors and also to scale through you know, some, of the, some of the leading majors. So the, the, cost, um, the cost reward for even a small operator is still, is still there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the cost reward is there because we save a tremendous amount of drilling. Mm-hmm. And so the savings in drilling far outweighs the, the cost of, of our solution. And so you know, that's the way we've focused the business. We, we don't want to sell customers technology. We want to sell them different outcomes so that they can optimize their exploration investment. And, and really that leads back to that 500% um, increase in minerals. The world's got to find 500% more. So mining companies need to stretch their drilling way further than they do today. And yeah. our technology certainly helps them do that. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, it's it's like, uh, yeah, it, of course they have to, but when you need to do, you know, a thousand holes to find, <laughs> to find so little, I mean, it's just huge, huge money. And you've got public, I mean, 
people like myself. I mean, I, I invest in some of these companies and it's, those are heavy numbers <laughs> when they go up there. And it, and it's, of course, you've got competing, you've got competing um, like the tech, the tech space and um, you know, the, the marijuana, not marijuana, what am I? Cannabis space. Um, those spaces are all competing for investor dollars as well. So my, I mean, when you're coming on here, I mean, I'm, I'm quite excited because it's showing that mine, mining can be this competitive industry um, at a whole other level than it's been. Um, you know, and not, I'm, I'm not certainly not knocking the industry, but now it seems like we're finally mining can type like Ideon can actually bring them to another level that's just been needed for so long. Yeah, I, mean, I think need is the mother of invention, and yeah. the industry hasn't needed to um, really, and therefore hasn't. But as you said, Jared, the social pressure uh, today for sustainably sourced minerals, um, social contract um, with communities, etc., is a huge um, need in terms of being, becoming a progressive mining company and becoming yeah. a successful mining company in the future. So yeah, it's uh, it's about the economics, but but more and more, it's about the social contract and the impact on the environment uh, from, from the mining activities. And so yeah, that, that's part of the reason why I see a, a lot of major mining companies moving very quickly. I mean, this in the end becomes a competitive space and who can, get, right. yeah. who can get there first, who can get the capabilities they need and who can, who can deliver the sustainably sourced nickel or copper or cobalt and whatever the mineral is. I mean, that's a strategic differentiator for those companies. What about other industries? Um, are you, I mean, there, this must be applicable to others as well. Yeah, it, it's actually a, a blessing um, of muon tomography. And, and in some ways, it's a bit of a curse because the, the technology can be applied in so many industrial markets and um, solving major problems. And, and it's kind of ironic that in the last few weeks, when we have you know, two passenger uh, flights to space, that we still know very little about the earth beneath our beneath our feet. I know we've done some water, we've done some uh, marine and water and those types of things, and it's just even that space is just like it's completely untapped. <laughs> it, it definitely is. So yeah, pr providing more um, higher definition, more certainty, and I guess that's the real crux of it. You know, when we say there's a density anomaly um, in a three D space, we say it with ninety five percent plus certainty. And no other geophysics technique wow. can come close to that. And so what that enables the, the, the client to do is either uh, know with certainty there is nothing in the area and therefore sterilize it and stop investing exploration dollars into that area, or understand that there is a density anomaly in an area and really pinpoint target where right. the next holes go uh, to optimize their, their investment and, and, of course, get, get to discovery quicker. Yeah. So, but even things like, I think I saw, I don't know if I saw this on your website, but I think even like, like national security and like things like they, there's, there's other, there's other space. Cause it's just, it's applicable to anything, right? It's basically discovering what is, what is underneath you essentially. Yeah. So the, the, there are a few other uh, verticals and um, oil and gas. Um, we're not a discovery tool in oil and gas. We're a reservoir monitoring tool um, that enables us to give near real time data to um, reservoir operators and so if you think about the Alberta oil sands, um, to be able to target um, steam in the steam-assisted gravity drainage method uh, drives a lot of efficiency in terms of energy consumption, um, but also improves oil recovery. And so that's the type of role we would, we would play in oil and, oil and gas. In infrastructure, there's a number of different use cases, uh, certainly detecting cracks on hydroelectric dams mm -hmm. is one that we've spent some time in with a, with a client. We're looking at in, imaging uh, the inside of uh, blast furnace in steel making operations. And actually another one is you know, working ahead of tunnel boring equipment um, to be able to detect oh. the high density that the tunnel boring uh, machine would ultimately, you know, ideally work, or, work, work around rather than having to drill through. Oh, uh, so yeah, we're, we're very blessed with a lot of different use cases, and, and actually, you know, in, in mining, we're today we're very focused on exploration. From those couple of hundred interviews we've done over the last eighteen months, what we heard back loud and clear was a whole series of other use cases in mine planning, in mine operations, in aftercare that our technology can also play a role in. The challenge is uh, not to have not chase after too many shiny things. Um, yeah. 
Well, we're uh, laser focused on the extra mineral exploration market. We think you know the, the dynamics there are, are primed for you know, major reinvention, and, and we want to play an active part. In that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've had this uh, discussion a couple times on the show with, uh, or no, actually on the Crownsman Energy show uh, with with uh, Q Energy, and they have the same thing, right? It's applicable to everything, their units, but you gotta. It's. I mean, do you do you have to? Is there a? Are there a lot of people? Are there a lot of industries that? I mean, you can start chasing any everything all day, I guess, right? So you have to probably be quite quite razor focused on what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. We've got to prove the technology, the business model. Um, we've got to prove it in a number of different geological scenarios. Right. You know, that's, that's a pretty substantial you know, plate of, of work to get done here over the next uh, year or two. So, yeah, we're, we're laser focused on that. And then as we get that done, um, yeah, absolutely, we'll explore other uh, markets. We have, we've done some exploration already. Um, but really, you know, it's being successful and helping customers be successful in exploration is our is our number one focus. You know, our, our mission, the way we describe it uh, as a company, you know, we want to help accelerate the world's transition to low impact mining. Yeah. And so that's our mission. We are, are laser focused on doing that with our mining customers. And it seems like you are. And I, I just, I was curious about something too. That I think V the V one to V three. I keep checking to make sure I'm not spelling the wrong thing. But V one to V three. Your team, this from a leadership perspective, um, I, I kind of get this picture in my mind of like Apple, you know, make it smaller, one button, you know, these, these stories that you, you hear floating around. Um, is it when you're working with your team, it's like they just, they finished the V1, it's worked, it's, everybody's, it's getting tested. Does everybody know that the V3 is coming? Like, no, this is just, we need to make, like, is everybody on the same page or do you have to walk in there after everybody celebrates and <laughs> go, okay, now smaller? No, I mean, the, the, the business was very aware of the need to uh, miniaturize the detectors and almost from our first proof of concept uh, back in 2012. Um, and so it's one thing to know it has to be done. It's another thing to actually go through the steps to and, and, and draw in the, the investment to be able to make that happen. And so the team were very well versed on, on the customer requirements. Um, you know, really, my role as I joined the business 18 months or so ago was really to you know, uh, increase our outreach with the industry substantially, bring investment in to execute on the product uh, roadmap and, and really build the, the commercial momentum um, in, the, in the business. Um, but the, the fact we had to miniaturize has been known for quite some time. Right. Is it, um, you know, from here, is it, is it most of the activity over the next year and a half is going to be taking it to, uh, is just scaling up commercialization uh, now with the, is it going to be the V3? Is that going to be the flagship over the next year and a half or so? Uh, absolutely. That'll be the flagship. Uh, although having said that, we've, uh, we've certainly been getting some demand for our V1 detectors as well as uh, the, the V3. So there are some use cases where the V1 detector makes, makes a ton of sense. Um, and so we'll we'll be predominantly focused on V3, and then if there's use cases where a V1 is is the tool for the job, we we won't hesitate to to apply that. In terms of the V3, the kind of the the roadmap we have for the next twelve months is um, you know, we're going to deploy a hundred detectors with you know probably ten customers. So we call it our early access program, and we're really looking to bring in mining partners who will work with us, iron out any kinks, and really get this solution finely tuned and ready for um, you know, more broadly commercial launch, more broad commercial launch in the second half of next year. Just before we wrap up, uh, Gary, I just wanted to ask just the, um, just the collaboration that something like this takes uh, to get this off the ground. I think I was, I think I saw it on your website. Like a, a, there's an actual list of all the organizations, you know, and universities and that that have partnered. I mean, just just before we go, can you just sort of give us a snapshot of, of a reality? Because there's going to be someone, it'll be someone like me who's going to got an entrepreneurial spirit and goes, well, <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. Can you give us a can you give us a picture of what it actually takes and sort of that whole village idea uh, to get something like like Ideon uh, to commercialization? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and actually, I, it's an area that I think the Canadian ecosystem should be rightly proud of. Um, it's one of the things that first struck me as I got to know the business, the nurturing, the investment, the support provided by the technology ecosystem has been tremendous. 
Um, the industry I've talked about a few times in terms of willingness to do you know, blind trials, field trials, to prove the efficacy um, of the technology and then be ready once we've proved it to immediately start deploying um, in other areas. And you mentioned academia. You know, we're very fortunate. We've got partnerships with Queen's University, UBC and Simon Fraser University here in British Columbia. They bring tremendous value uh, to, to the equation. Um, the government and the federal government, the provincial government are also partners that we're working in, you know, as Canada's developing its critical minerals list, we're working to see how, how we can help um, those uh, priorities from the government uh, to be realized. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very big um, kind of consortium philosophy. Um, for me, I, I firmly believe in you know, one plus one plus one equals five or maybe ten. And um, when we bring those different um, you know, skill sets and experiences together in a powerful way, it enables us to move quicker with better insight and, and better solutions for the customer. It's very exciting. Very, very exciting, Gary. I think um, it's going to, uh, it's, uh, I've said, I, I say this to many guests. Um, I, I haven't said it to every guest, <laughs> but I, I say it to many because so much of what we're doing on the show is we're starting a story. Um, I hope you come back on because, um, I, I think in a year and a half, two years, there's going to be a lot more to discuss and what you're doing. It, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, I, of course we're going to have links and everything so people can check out your, your, the information and your company. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show. We really do appreciate it. That's great, Jared. Thanks for hosting us. Have a great conversation. Okay. I'm, I'm almost getting terrified of who uh, Rory's going to bring next. <laughs> <laughs> It's so fun. I just, it just, when I first open up these documents, because he creates the document, right, and notes and that, and I go, I don't even begin to know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so two weeks in, and then, but we always book out. That's, we always book out a month, and that's part of the reason. So I can start to familiarize myself with it. So, um, Gowdy, uh, great show today. Where can people like, follow, subscribe, suggest guests, et cetera? All right. Well, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got a ton of new episodes coming, um, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, you can also follow us, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, anywhere, really. Twitter. Are we active on Twitter? You know, <laughs> we probably I thought check. at one point we were. I'm not sure now. I don't think we're controversial, we controversial, controversial enough. enough. Yeah. We, sh we should. <laughs> um, but no, definitely, again, subscribe, like, share. Uh, and if you'd like to be on one of our the shows, whether it's Mining Now, Crownsman Energy, uh, Crownsman Egg, or the Crownsman Show, uh, please contact us, info at crownsman.com. You can also contact us if you know someone that should be on this show um, and you'd like to recommend them. Uh, yeah, please contact us. Oh, and Change Itself. We also help produce that uh, show. Yes, yeah. which they have a new episode coming out uh, soon, uh, I think this week. So <laughs> you don't want to miss that. They're really good. Yeah. They're really good. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm taking notes on on from, the, from on their how, hosting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually how to do it. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for putting it all together. Thank you, Gary and Ideon, uh, for joining the show. Um, please keep watching. We will see you on the next episode of Mining Now.